Oh, they brought the woman. They didn't bring the man. Mm-hmm. One theory is, I heard one preacher say, you know why they didn't bring the man? Y'all want to know why? I'm just talking about what a preacher said. The Bible didn't say, I'm just saying what a preacher said. Because it was one of their own. Mm-hmm. And they weren't about to throw one of their own under the bus. Maybe it was one of them in the crowd. Huh? Maybe it was one of them in the crowd. It was one of them in the crowd. It's one of them in the church. Mm-hmm. It's one of them that was in the choir. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 It happened in the church too, though. Yeah. Don't play. We, we know it happened in the church too. Yeah. Okay, so, but they brought the one. All right, we good. Y'all still with me. I just want to make sure y'all was awake. Because I know y'all sleepy and y'all, some of y'all might be hungry and some of y'all hungry and sleepy. We're going to keep going. Ah. All right, wherever it was at, the very end. Now, Moses of the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what say thou? This they said, tempting him that they might to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. And when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without what? In. Uh huh. Keep going. And stooped down back again and wrote on the ground. Now I wonder what he wrote on that ground. He obviously wrote something. On the ground that they saw that moved them. It moved their conscience. Mm. I'm just going to leave that alone. I'm not even going to talk about that. Mm. And when Jesus lifted up, he said, he said, uh, let me, when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw, un, saw none but the woman, he said unto her, woman, where are those thine accusers? Mm. Had no man condemned thee? She said, no, man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, what? Here he goes. He forgave her sins. But notice what he told her. Now, when you go, you know what you've done. But don't do that no more. And neither do I condemn thee. That's powerful, ain't it? She knew who Jesus was. And she knew that if Jesus said, I forgive you, she knew she was forgiven. Mm -hmm. Hmm? Are y'all out there? All right, right, I got time, I got time. I should pause one more place. Let me go here real quick. I still got time. Go with me back to Matthew. I want to share something else with you. I said if I was running early, I'd tell you. If I was running late, I wouldn't. But since we're running early, I'm going to tell you this one too. Still dealing with forgiveness in case you don't know. Put it in your pocket and hopefully bless you. Mm-hmm. All right. I'm in Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. I'm in verse 31 and 32. You should be able to bless somebody. Tell them what you're learning at the Bible study. Tell them how your life is being blessed. And tell them how your life's being changed. Because somebody needs to hear what you have. And they want the Jesus you have. Amen? Amen. All right, I'm in Matthew chapter 12. Look with me in verse 31 and 32. Amen? Amen. Can I ask, baby, would you mind reading that for me? Or you want me just going to read it? You want me to read it? You go, okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay, okay. Here we go. I'm in Matthew 31. First word is wherefore. Are y'all there with me? All right. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto, unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Hmm. And whatsoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, even if you speak a word against Jesus, notice what the Bible says, it shall be forgiven. Hmm? But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. My, my, my. Hmm? Amen. I heard somebody say, my, 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 my. Look at what God said. There's one sin I cannot forgive. Now notice what he said. He can forgive everything else. 
We're going to cover some of that in the next lesson. Man. But notice what he said, I can't forgive. I cannot forgive disrespecting the Holy Ghost. Mm. Yeah. I cannot, I cannot forgive cursing against the Holy Ghost. Mm. I won't do it. Now, does anybody can tell me why the cursing or blasphemy against the Holy Ghost cannot be forgiven? I just want to throw this in as an extra, extra before I go to Calvary's cross. Can you tell me why the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost can't be forgiven? Anybody know why? The Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity. Okay. You, but notice, you can blaspheme even Jesus. That'll be forgiven. But you can't blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Hmm. I'm just trying to give you something you may not have thought about or increase what it is you know. See, that's why I like Bible studies. You can ask questions. You want me to just go on and tell you or what? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The Bible said, Jesus said, that when I leave, I'm going to send a comforter. And that Bible says, no man is drawn to the Father except what? The Spirit draws him. Right? So if Jesus is gone and now the Holy Ghost is here, when you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, you don't have nothing to draw you back to the Father. Mm -hmm. And God says, now you're going to curse against that which you need to be drawn to me? You And I, and I know somebody that did that and I tried to tell him, boy, you better watch what you say. Mm -hmm. He said, I don't care. And he repeated it. I said, you just blasphemed the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to tell you, that won't be forgiven. Mm -hmm. So that's why blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. We need, how many of y'all know, when, even when you come to God's house, what draws you when Pastor Nolan is preaching or the power falls? It's the Holy Ghost, mm -hmm. which then draws you to repentance, which draws you to want to go on and continue in this warfare and keep going on for God, that we can be ready for the rapture and get up out of here. Amen? It's the spirit even now in this Bible study that God please convict us to change and get rid of our unforgiveness and forgive. Hmm? It's the spirit of God but when you blaspheme the spirit of God that's it. We don't have nothing else to draw us. Amen? Amen. I just want to throw that in there. I hope that helps somebody and bless somebody. Okay. So now I need to go to this last place this last point and we're going to talk about why did Jesus say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do? Now, where did Jesus make that statement? On the cross. Huh? And all we all agree it was on the cross? No, it was when he put him on the cross. He was nailed to the cross. Well, he was nailed to the cross. Mm -hmm. But notice on the cross of Calvary, he said, Father, forgive them. Well, they know not what they do. Amen? Amen? But in order to talk about that statement, I need to look at what happened prior to that that he had to ask his father to forgive them. Are y'all with me? Because this is a powerful statement. I'm getting ready. Where I'm getting ready to take you right now is, you see, when Jesus told you to take up your cross and follow me, guess what? We got a cross to bear. But if we are following Jesus, and when Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, that means we got to go through the same things Jesus went through and get on the cross and be able to say, forgive them. But let's look at what, he, what, what Jesus asked his father to do. And I'm going to show you in a minute here, God was upset. Now, so I can lay this scene and lay this thing right for you. I need you to go with me real quick. Because I'm going to want you to see this principle before I go here. And i got plenty of time. And we're going to be out here on time to go eat, all right? <laughs> I'm in Genesis chapter 2. Stay with me. I want to give you a different point of view about forgiveness and Jesus being on the cross. Jesus was full of forgiveness. And he still is. All right? So what I'm going to show you here, this same principle you see here, we're going to see at Calvary's cross. Now I'm in Genesis chapter 22. I'm going to be reading verse 1 and 2 and verses 11 and 12. Okay? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And I'm going to prove to you that same Jesus lives inside of you 
And whatever it is you wrote down the person you can't forgive or the situation you, you can't forgive, Jesus went through more than that and still was able to say, forgive him. Now I'm in Genesis 22. Same principle here. We're going to see it, we're going to see it again. I'm going to prove it to you in just a minute. I'm in verse 1. First word is and. Are y'all there? Yeah. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. Meaning, I had to try you, Abraham. I have to try you to see if you want what it is you said you want. I'm going to try you. And said unto Abraham, he said, Abraham, I'm sorry, let me do that again. That God tempted Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, behold, I'm here. And he said, take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Now y'all know this story and y'all know what happened. Amen? Amen? But I want y'all to know that's critical. He had to try Abraham. God has to try us. I told y'all that last week. And I'm going to keep covering it more next week when we're talking about our forgiveness. But here we go. Now I'm in verse 11. Now notice what it says. You know what happened. They're going up the mountain. Isaac already knew how the sacrifice was supposed to go down, but notice what Isaac. Isaac, wait a minute, hey Dad, I see we got the wood. I know we ready to build this altar, but uh, I don't know. Hey, where's the uh, where's the uh, where's the sacrifice? What did Abraham say? The Lord will provide. But I also want you to notice when Abraham, when Isaac got on that altar, you don't see Isaac saying a mumbling word. Why? Because Isaac was willing. To lay down his life because he trusted his father. And Isaac trusted God. And if this is what God wanted, even Isaac was willing to give God what God wanted. Okay? Here we go. Now, and the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, and said, Abraham, Abraham. Now we know what's getting ready to go down here. He's throwing back the knife. And he's getting ready to slay Isaac on the, on the altar, is he not? God called out of heaven. Abraham, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast withheld, hast, thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. What did he not withhold from God? Even the thing that he loved the most. See, God's going to try us, even the thing we love the most. God's going to see if we love that thing more than we love God. Mm. I don't think I need to say that again. Even the thing we love the most, do we love that more than we love the giver? Do we love the gift more than the giver? Because that's what God wants to know. So what am I saying? You know, some people say, well, God already knew what he was going to do. No, it's not that God knew what he was going to do. God knew Abraham had a choice. Either to do what God wanted or to not do what God wanted. And it's the same with us. God knows in theory. Why did God know in theory? God knows in theory we have two choices. But God leaves the choice up to us. Right. Right. Are y'all with me? Mm -hmm. I heard somebody say right. That's the way that goes. Mm -hmm. God only knows in theory. So what is God looking for? God is looking for an experience. Of us making the right choice. Mm. That's why God was able to say, Now I know you show me you love me. You see what I'm saying? Are y'all with me? Yeah. Theory and experience. Theory and experience. You say, Well, God already knows. God already knows me. He knows I'm a choosing. God knows after He's tried you, He knows. Mm. But up until He tries you and puts you in the fiery furnace. Mm. That's when God knows what you'll choose. Hmm. Are y'all with me? Okay. All right, now go with me now because I'm proving my point about Calvary. Now, go with me to Matthew 27. We're still way ahead of time, so I'm good. Now, I got to lay this groundwork here. Same principle here at Calvary's cross. He said, preacher, prove it to me. Prove it then. Because see, the Bible can defend itself. So what happens? Jesus is now... We know Jesus was going to Calvary. He came to go to Calvary's cross. 
to save mankind and save creation from their sin and redeem what Adam didn't do in the garden. Okay? So here we are. They come to the garden to get Jesus. Now keep in mind now, Jesus was in constant communication with his father. Say, so how do I know that? When Jesus was baptized and John baptized Jesus and Jesus came up out of the water, what happened? The Holy Spirit came on him and then what? This is my beloved son. Then you heard of the Bible says there was a voice out of heaven. Are y'all out there? And the people around there heard it. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. They heard that voice. Are y'all with me? Jesus is in constant communication with his father. Stay with me. Then on the Mount of Transfiguration, same thing. Disciples with him. They see Elijah and Moses. Then when they try to say they're going to make a tabernacle competing with Jesus, the father said, oh, no, you're not. They don't compare to my son. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Are y'all with me? He's in constant communication with his father. Jesus also said, I only do what I see my father do. Amen. So everything Jesus did, why? I see my father do, boom. In other words, and so every time he prayed, I go and pray unto my father. I'm trying to prove a point here. Jesus in constant communication with his father. Are y'all with me? All right, let's go. I'm in, okay, that's my time. I got 10 minutes. We're going to get this done here. I'm in, uh, I'm in Matthew chapter 27. Now, I got to go this way with you because I need to show you something. That what Jesus said on the cross, and maybe I should just tell it to you because I'm running out of time. So maybe I just need to go there, but I want you to see something. I'm in Matthew chapter 27, and I want you to notice here. Uh, they came and got Jesus. They bring him to the judgment hall, and he's in front of Pilate. Now I need to tell you that it wasn't just Jesus and Pilate. When you study your Bible, you'll find out there were six Hundred soldiers there in the judgment hall. Six hundred soldiers in the judgment hall. And at least two hundred of them got to put their hands on Jesus. And it wasn't nice what they did to him. I'm going to tell you now, it wasn't nice. But I got to read something to you. Again, Father, forgive them. Are you with me? All right. So notice what it says here. It says in verse 26, Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Now, how many of y'all know what a scourging is? Anybody know what a scourging is? Scourging. Oh, was it? Is that it? That's all it was? Ah, uh, slow you wrong. I'm just going to tell you what it is. Because I can promise you, it's worse than whatever you're going to say. But I'm going to read to you what the historians say about scourging. Because see, scourging was one of the worst tortures that the Roman soldiers would do to criminals. And it was really meant to kill them. But God said in Hebrews that he gave Jesus a prepared body. Why? To endure the suffering. And you got to remember, Jesus is taking on the sin of all mankind. So God had to prepare him a special body to endure the suffering that he had to try his son in. Are y'all with me? Now, let me just read this to you because, see, we get scourged and don't know it. But Jesus did what we couldn't do. All right? I'm talking about getting to the cross now. Y'all with me? All right. Scourging was a Roman imp implement for severe body punishment. It consisted of a handle with about a dozen leather straps with metal and glass, jagged pieces of bone at the end to make the blow more painful and effective. Oh, this gets worse. Um, here we go. The victim was tied to a post and the blows were applied to the bare back and loins and sometimes to the face and bowels. The flesh was cut in several places by each blow. So hideous was the punishment that the victim often fainted and some died under it. Mm. It was designed to get confessions and secrets from its victims. But what could they get from an innocent, sinless man? Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, the flogging was permitted by law up to 40 stripes. And they would reduce it by one because if you went to 40 or if you went over 41, the person who was doing the whipping, now they're going to do it to you. Mm. Okay? Um, it said that he received 40 stripes. And there were 12 thongs on the end of his handle, which would hit 39 times, which made a total of 468 stripes. Mm. Now, I want y'all to get a picture of that. Hold on, hold that. Just stay right there. Don't go nowhere with that question. What they would do is they would tie you to a pole, not like in the, not like in the Passion of the Christ. Oh, no, no, no. You got tied to a pole, and you were stretched to your tippy toes. To make sure the skin was nice and tight. Mm -hmm. And then they would take that thing and it would hit, and when it would catch on the body, they would yank that off. In other words, I'm yanking flesh off your body. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about Jesus had to, why Jesus, uh, why Simon and Cyrene had to come carry the cross? Because Jesus had so much blood loss. Mm -hmm. His body went into convulsions when they put their purple robe on him. When they yanked that robe off, his body went into convulsions. Because you gotta remember, it's stuck. Then you take it off. Now he's going through convulsions. But notice the Bible says he never said a mumbling word. I'm talking about Father, forgive them. Are y'all with me? What else did he say? If the scourge, is it 12 thorns? If some struck in the, in the same place and cut deeper each time, one can see how his body, because of the intense hatred, hmm. By each blow was marred more than any other man. Are y'all with me? Now go with me real quick to Isaiah. Are we still doing good? Isaiah, I mean Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah chapter 52 verse 14. I'm going to show you what happened when Jesus went on Calvary's cross. And this same Jesus lives inside of you and suffered this for you and me. <coughs> Amen? I'm in uh, Isaiah 52. I'm in verse 14. Are y'all there? Are y'all there? Yes, sir. Isaiah 52 verse 14. And notice what the word says. And now keep in mind, here's the theory. God knew what his son was going to suffer. In theory, God knew are y'all there? As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So now let me read you what that's about. Disfigured. The word marred means to be disfigured. They disfigured Jesus before they even put him on the cross. Mm. Are y'all with me? The idea is that his sufferings, the Messiah, was so bruised, beaten, marred, disfigured, stripped, striped, mutilated, injured, spat upon, and torn, that his outward appearance was so awful to behold. He suffered so much that even the most wicked of hard-hearted men shuddered with shock at such treatment heaped upon him by his enemies. He became so disfigured and destitute of his natural beauty and handsomeness that men were stricken with amazement and disgust and heart sickness at what they saw. The more perfect his body, the more marred he seemed in suffering. I want y'all to see that. You say, preacher, why are you pointing that out? I'm pointing that out because now here he is on Calvary's cross. Now they whipped him, they scarred him. Now what they do? Now he's got to go on Calvary's hill. This man ain't got no, no, he ain't got the strength to carry that cross. So what they do? They get Simon the Cyrene, and Cyrene is a country in Africa, which lets you know it was a black man. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you a little secret. That's why black people are so blessed. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, indeed. It has something to do with Simon the Cyrene, but that's another topic for another day. Mm -hmm. Are y'all out there? All 
So now, so what happens? Now go with me to Luke chapter 23, and we're getting ready to close. Luke chapter 23. Let me show you how good God is. When you pay attention to the details of what you read. I'm in Luke chapter 23. Look at verse 34. Are y'all there? Then Jesus, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So now what happened? Not only was his body mutilated, so now by the time they get him up Calvary's hill and the cross is on the ground, what did they do? Now they commence with the nail. Now think about that. He's already mutilated. There ain't no pretty picture like you see up on the wall that they got up on the walls. No way, no how, no can do. <laughs> it's not how it was. He was mutilated. Then they go to driving the nail in his hands. They go to the next hand. Mm. Then they put his feet together and now they're doing their feet. Mm. Then the Bible says now they got to lift this cross up and drop it in a hole. History says that when they dropped it in the hole, the body would then jerk, mm -hmm. which was meant to cause convulsions. Mm -hmm. Are y'all listening to me? Yeah, so think about this. All this condition Jesus is in, what does he say? He says the things he says, but then notice one of the last things he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know why he had to say that? Because the Father was angry and what they did to his son. He knew they were going to do that, but he didn't know they were going to do it as mean and as hateful as they were, and God allowed it. Are y'all listening to me? But that's, well, let me tell you something else. But you know what Jesus did when he proved to God? I am a spotless lamb. Father, you got forgiveness in me, and I even have to forgive them for this. Father, forgive them. Because they don't know what they're doing and their hatred for me. But this is why I came here to forgive. And I even have to forgive this. Are y'all out there? Y'all see that? Oh, I see some of y'all moved. I can tell some of y'all are moved. That's why the Passion of the Christ didn't really paint that picture that well. But he did the best he could. But what am I trying to say? You got a Jesus in you that can forgive anything but blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. Can he forgive? Well, I want to say something, but we got children in here, but y'all know what I want to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to cover that next week, but what am I trying to say? You got a Jesus in you. You can never say after the day, you can't forgive because Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Mm -hmm. And when he did that, he sealed the deal that he was the spotless lamb. To then what? The Bible said he elevated up to a place high above the heavens, above every name that's named. Why? Because he exemplified what forgiveness was. Thank you, Lord. Are y'all out there? Yeah. Right. Hmm? Hmm? Thank you, Lord. If Jesus can forgive all of that and became a mutilated piece of meat on Calvary's cross, but then know what the Lord said, now you got to take up your cross. Mm. Which means what? You and I, too, are going to have to suffer some things. Mm -hmm. To prove to God what? God, I'll go through anything for you. Hmm. I love you enough that I'll give my own life if I have to, because you gave yours. But then what? God says you have to forgive those things that's been done in your life that you say you can't forgive. Oh, yes, you can. Because if Jesus can forgive all of that, you ain't, none of us have been, been in that situation. Mm. None of us probably, and then think about this. Remember this now. Jesus never said a mumbling word. Mm. And I'm going to show you next week how we go through things. We want to curse the people that's doing things that's hurting us. The Lord said, no, I want you to forgive that. Because mm. how else are they going to know I live in you? How are they going to know you're a child of God? And how are they going to know that walking with the Lord is the best thing that can happen in their life? Uh. Until they see you do what it is you say you want to do and do it because you love God that much, I'm going to forgive that. Uh. 
How do you know you're forgiven? When you get around them and there ain't no pain. Mm -hmm. And again, I said it last week, I said it again, I didn't say you got to fellowship with them. Mm -hmm. But when you get around them, it don't hurt no more. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Am I making sense to anybody? Amen. Are y'all blessed with that lesson right there? Amen. Brother, you had a question? Well, when you answered the question, I was just going to ask you, you know, about that thing that was whooping the blood. Yes, sir. 